Did you know that each year more than 10 billion medical tests are ordered in this country alone? That means that each of us will have about 40 tests this year. Too often, doctors prescribe these tests without explaining how they're done or what they mean. I'm Eleanor Shano, and we're going to tell you what you need to know before you get your next medical test. That on tonight's edition of AgeWise Weekly. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to AgeWise. Well, you know the drill. The doctor orders a medical test. You worry a little bit. You don't ask any questions. You make an appointment. You worry a little more. You have the test. Then you wait for the results, and you worry a little more. Did it ever occur to you to ask whether that test was necessary? Now, you just heard me say a minute ago, the average person has 40 medical tests a year. Let's find out why. Let's meet my guest. His name is Dr. John Wisniewski, and uh, Dr. Wisniewski is an internist, uh, specialty gerontology at St. Margaret Memorial Hospital. Okay, first question. We seem to be having more and more tests all the time. Are any of these driven by the fact that physicians have to worry about malpractice and you have to worry about, gee, you, you might miss something and you might be sued? Well, certainly that's part of the problem. Uh, I think uh, some of the problem is the news media, too and certainly relations, neighbors. For example, somebody will come in with a headache and they'll say, well, my neighbor lady, she had an MRI. I want an MRI. Or my uh, friend had chest pain, he got a catheterization. Give me a catheterization. So I think uh, the media plays a, a large role in that these days. What do you use as a guideline in prescribing a test? In prescribing tests, I use my best clinical judgment. That's the, the only way to go. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that uh, uh, you are looking for something specifically or you don't know what you're looking for so you just want to screen the whole body and well it'd be nice if it was Star Trek technology and you were able to plug a person into a magic box and just get the answer like Bones McCoy used to do uh, we can't do that we're probably problem driven right now meaning if you come in and you describe a complaint to me be a chest pain abdominal pain then I'm gonna shoot for that organ for example, I'll work up your liver if you're describing right upper quadrant abdominal pain. If you're describing chest pain, then maybe it's your heart, maybe it's your esophagus, maybe it's pectus ulcer disease. Uh, I, I really need to listen to you. 90% of ordering of tests comes from what you're telling me. Probably 5% comes from my examination. Another 5% comes from intuition. What happens if a doctor orders a test, you don't want the test? Who has the last word? Well, uh, that's a difficult situation. Do you ever run into that? Do you ever order a test and a patient says, I don't want to have that test, Doc. It hurts. I, I don't think I need it. Many times we run into it. What we do is we sit down with the patient and we say, listen, this is the reason I want to get the test. Maybe I'm worried about cancer. Maybe they've lost 20 pounds. Maybe I'm worried about that they may have a heart attack walking out of the office. I explain my reasons. Mm -hmm. If the patient is still adamant about not getting the test done, then I say, listen, why don't you bring your family in next week? We'll talk about it. And sometimes with uh, a time element, you could eventually get the patient to understand your viewpoint. Doctor, aren't there some risks involved in some of these tests? And if there are, do, do you explain the risk to the patient? You try and explain the risk to the patients. There's risks almost with every single test that we do. For example, a simple blood test, you could get a hematoma or you could start bleeding afterwards. Uh, some of the other tests like... No one's like, ever told me that. Doctors always said, here, I, we want to have a blood workup. He's never told me that there was any risk involved. Well, it's such a mundane thing. I, I think we just slough it off and probably not the best thing to do. Okay. We are going to run down a list of some of the most common tests. And we have prepared a list of questions for Dr. Wisniewski. Let's start with MRIs. A lot of people today, as you say, they come in and they say, I want an MRI. What is an MRI? MRI, the latest and greatest technology we have and also the most expensive. It's called magnetic resonance imaging. And what it does is look at your organ tissues as though they were magnetic poles. And it runs via a large magnet. 
Uh, it's very similar to a CAT scanning that you slide into this uh, donut shaped device where the magnet is. It's often very noisy. Usually it does not cause any risk. The biggest problem we have if people have metal in their bodies like pacemakers or metal hips. What if people have claustrophobia? Well, that's a, uh, and that can a big be a real problem. problem if you have to slide into this big cylinder. Absolutely. Uh, all right, what did we do before we had MRIs? We did CAT scans. And CAT scans are a very similar type procedure. It's a computerized axial tomography. It's a computerized picture. It's looking at your body almost in three dimensions. Same as x-rays? Well, it's a little bit different cut than an x-ray. It's a little bit more uh, radioactive dose also given to you. Okay, how do you prepare? Uh, the doctor says that uh, you need an MRI. How do you prepare for it? For an MRI, there's really not that much preparation. Uh, usually, if there's any contrast given, it's given intravenously. Some of the centers will use some oral contrast. If that's the case, then you'll probably be on a clear liquid diet for breakfast. Okay, how does it feel? Does it hurt? Any pain involved? The biggest problem with an MRI is the claustrophobic feeling. Uh -huh. Occasionally, we may have to give something like Valium to uh, calm fears. What are the risks? Really not that many risks with the MRI itself. Are the, res are the results conclusive? In any test, the results are not 100% conclusive. Yes, they give us a very good detailed picture of what's going on, and many times it's a better picture than with a CAT scan. Does it lead to the exact diagnosis? Oftentimes, you may need to resort to a biopsy to get that. What, uh, Dr. Wisniewski, what are you looking for when you call for an MRI? Are you looking for a tumor? Are you looking for, for, for what? I mean, if I come to you and I say, I've been having headaches lately, and you say, um, well, maybe we're going to do an MRI, what are you looking for? Many times what you're looking for with an MRI is some sort of anatomical defect, be it a tumor, be it a stroke. Uh, some of the imaging centers are quite good at looking at blood flow. So they can do what's called an MRI angiogram, where they look at the blood flow through the carotids or the vertebral basal or system. So actually, it can be used for quite a few different things. Do you think MRIs are over-prescribed these days? Absolutely. Uh, there is a position paper by the American College of Physicians during the past six months looking at back pain. We all resort to MRIs now because it's the latest and greatest technology. The position paper now says that maybe we should go back and do a CAT scan at a third the cost giving the same information. Okay, who's paying for the MRIs? We are all paying for the MRIs. We pay our insurance, our companies pay. It is what a very expensive. What does an MRI cost? Uh, Me a ballpark figure. A ballpark figure is probably a thousand to fourteen hundred dollars per test. A CAT scan will probably be about a third that cost. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Uh, MRIs are covered by insurance, right? Mm -hmm. For the most part. Okay. Um, hear often about uh, doctors, physician groups who actually go out and buy some of this very expensive equipment. Uh, it would seem to me that maybe they are going to prescribe more tests than necessary to pay for the equipment. Do you think that ever happens? Happens all the time. I mean, if you have a Mercedes in your garage, you're going to drive it. If you have an MRI in your office, you're going to use it. But I'm the patient. and. Uh, and you say there's no risk involved and uh, we're going to prescribe a, an MRI just because the equipment is there? Sometimes I think that enters into the equation depending on what the diagnosis is and what the physician is thinking of. What it's incumbent on the patient to do is ask the uh, physician questions and okay, say, why am questions. I getting this? Why am I getting it? That, that's the first question. That's key. Is this test necessary? Okay. Right, and that's, that's a very important question. I mean, when I say to somebody, listen, I want to do an MRI of your brain because you've had headaches that are worsening over the past three months, then I tell them, maybe it's a tumor. Maybe it's a vascular malformation that you were born with and now is coming to light. Maybe it's nothing more than sinusitis, but all I know is you're getting worse and I need the information. Okay, and I say no, and you say I think you need it, and at this point, maybe you want me to sign a waiver hmm? so I don't come back to you uh, uh, six months down the road with a brain tumor and you say I, I, I couldn't diagnose it because you wouldn't have the test. Well, I, I must admit I don't resort to those extreme measures, <laughs> although I know some of my colleagues do. Uh, usually what I say is, okay, go home, talk about it with your family in a week, give me a call. If you want to have your family come in, that's fine. I'll be happy to talk with them. Statistics say that um, most of us have about 40 medical tests a year. 
chances are you have had one this year or two or more. And if you have any questions, uh, we'd like to hear from you. We're going to talk about some more common medical tests when AgeWise continues. Our number is 683-1600. Give us a call. Has your car been feeling sluggish lately? A little out of sorts? Well, don't worry, because the doctor's in at Lucille's Car Care Clinic, and there's no problem she can't solve. Whether it's questions about tires or transmissions, or great tips for buying a car, Pittsburgh's own Lucille Tregenown has the how-to news for you. So for free advice, remember, if you need help, don't go on the road until you've seen the doctor first at Lucille's Car Care Clinic, Thursday nights at 9.30 on WQEX 16. Take a ride back to yesteryear and revisit the American frontier of the late 1800s and meet five memorable women who made the Wild West their home. I can swing an axe or use a saw the same as a man. I go always where the Lord calls me. Don't miss Nobody's Girls, Five Women of the West, Saturday afternoon at 1.30 here on WQEX. Take a trip to 1920s era Maitwan, West Virginia, for a compelling and compassionate drama set against the backdrop of a labor dispute. You think this man is your enemy? Huh? This is a worker. Mary McDonnell and James Earl Jones star in the intimate epic from the heart of coal mining country, Maitwan, Sunday night at 8, here on WQEX. Welcome back. I'm Eleanor Shano. My guest tonight, Dr. John Wisniewski. We're talking about medical tests. Are they all necessary? Are some of them unnecessary? What are some things that you should know before you have your next medical test? Doctor, what does it mean when a physician says to a patient, I want a biopsy? That's a pretty scary sound. Well, it is pretty scary stuff. What it means is they've probably done a screening test, chest x-ray, CAT scan, MRI, abdominal series, sonogram, and they found an abnormality. They don't know what it is. And the definitive way of finding it out is to get a biopsy, get a piece of it, and send it to a pathologist to examine it under a microscope. And many times they can give you the answer. Oftentimes they may say, we need a bigger piece of tissue and you have to get a re repeat biopsy. I suppose that uh, where the biopsy is being done would determine the kind of preparation. A, a skin biopsy would be a lot different than a liver biopsy. That's right. Uh, anything uh, pertaining to the GI tract, usually you have to refrain from eating for about 12 hours before the test. The skin biopsy, there's no preparation for. A lung biopsy, again, you probably will not be able to eat anything once you go to bed at nighttime. Those are usually scheduled for the morning to make it easier and convenient for the patient. What are the risks involved? Well, biopsies actually are a little bit risky. Uh, certainly you have the risk of bleeding. You're putting a needle into different areas of the body to try and get a piece of tissue. Sometimes you're doing it blindly. Sometimes you're doing it with the guidance of a sonogram or CAT scan. Uh, certainly infections can be introduced into it. For lung biopsies, you always uh, worry about what's called a pneumothorax, where the lung becomes uh, pierced by the biopsy needle itself. Are the results conclusive? If the tissue is uh, obtained appropriately, then yeah, usually you have uh, conclusive results. Occasionally, the pathologist says, I can't tell anything, you have to go in and do a repeat biopsy. Okay, our phone number is 683-1600. Should we go to the phones? Do we have uh, caller line eight? Go ahead, you're on the air. Hello? Hi, go ahead. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, can you hear us? Yeah, faintly. I think that there are too many uh, tests done on people that are really unnecessary. Okay, why do you say that, caller? Because uh, in 1980, I went into the hospital. We'll skip all the preliminaries. Mm -hmm. I went into the hospital with congestive heart failure. Mm -hmm. They ran tests on me. I did not get out of the hospital. It was the middle, the early part of December. Mm -hmm. I didn't get out of the hospital until the middle part of February. They ran tests on me. They did everything imaginable. They even did what he just said about the liver biopsy, 
which was unnecessary because as it turned out, I had a growth inside my heart. Now, I went to one doctor before this and he said, you have a pulled stomach muscle. So I went to a chiropractor. Another doctor said, you have a dislocated hip. Another doctor told me it was my imagination. Mm -hmm. I went to a gynecologist and he said, do you know that your heart sounds like a freight train? And it wasn't about a couple nights later that I went into the hospital into congestive heart failure. Okay, it sounds to me um, that perhaps this patient had a, a very difficult condition to diagnose, right? Well, tough to condition to diagnose and maybe uh, sometimes seeing a general internist or a family practice doc who deals with the body from head to toe helps mm -hmm. instead of seeing specialists. Boy, they do though. When they get you in the hospital, they do run a lot of tests, doctor. In the old days, we used to, under these cost-conscious managed care <laughs> things environment, changing, right? things have changed dramatically, in which case we do many of those tests as an outpatient now. Check, and check with the gatekeeper and see whether you're allowed to do Absolutely. the tests or not. Call our line seven. Go ahead. You're on the air. Good evening, Eleanor. I love your show. Thank you. I was wondering if, you'd ask, if, if I could ask the doctor sure. a question. Sure. Is there any specific test to show nerve damage? I have been to 10 doctors had MRIs, had every test available, my diaphragm, my diaphragm will not expand and I have like razors just cutting me constantly. This has been going on for three years. Now it's going into my legs and the bottoms of my heels. I've taken this nerve conduction test, nothing shows, and I was in an accident and there is something dreadfully wrong with me and no doctor can find out. Well, it sounds like they're doing the best they can with the 1990s technology. You've had the scans, you've had the EMGs and nerve conduction studies. It may be that it's just going to be a while before the tests become conclusive. My best uh, advice to you would be stick with your physician, and it may be that in six months when they repeat these tests, you may come up with a conclusive answer. Doctor, uh, the, the patient has to be, the caller has to be pretty frustrated. Uh, after three years, is it time maybe to check with another doctor to get another opinion? Absolutely. A second opinion or a third opinion is very worthwhile. Sure. Okay, caller, line six. You're on the air with Dr. Wisniewski. Yes, my own grandmother just recently had an MRI done for, because she had tingles in her, in her hand and foot. And I was wondering what would, what would be the reason that she had that MRI. Tingles in your hand and foot. Can I ask where the MRI was? It was in um, Passman Hospital. Oh, no, 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 no. What part of the, the body? body? Oh, um, the brain. Okay. What they're looking for with uh, a brain MRI is to see if there's multiple strokes or if there may be something called normal pressure hydrocephalus or maybe there's a tumor that may be causing all those complaints. Okay. Thank you, caller. Our number is 683-1600. Uh, let's go to another test, a common test, a pulmonary function test. Pulmonary function tests, actually they're very useful and typically you would do that in somebody who would say, Doc, I get winded after walking one flight of steps or if I walk out to get the mail, I'm short of breath, I'm huffing and puffing by the time I get in. Mm -hmm. And they tell us how much air that the uh, lungs can generate and how they expand. It could also tell us something like a diffusion capacity, which is the amount of oxygen that you get from the outside environment into your bloodstream. Typically, we do it a lot on smokers. Many times, people who smoke will come to me and say, well, does my chest x-ray look like emphysema? Well, most times it doesn't. And so what we have to resort to are pulmonary function tests, and there we may find signs of the emphysema. Any risk involved with this kind of a test? With pulmonary function tests, usually not. Now, if somebody's using a pulmonary function test to uh, determine whether they have asthma or reactive airways, sometimes they may use different inhalers and that can cause a reaction, but uh, usually it's done in the presence of a physician and actually quite safe. Do it right in your office or do you have to be sent to a specialist? No, many of the offices can do pulmonary function testing in their office, although uh, the uh, hospitals can usually do lung volumes and diffusion capacity, which the offices cannot. Okay, 683-1600, we're talking about medical tests some 40 of them done on the average person in the United States every year. If you have any questions about uh, any medical tests that you have had or have coming up, give us a call. We'll be right back.
Get set for gardening like you've never seen it with a friendly atmosphere on Jane Nugent's Garden Party. I don't bite. <laughs> WTAE AM's Jane Nugent will give you tips on everything from planting trees to recipes for edible flowers. Aren't they refreshing? Yeah, they are. Oh, I love them. Very good. And fantastic craft ideas. Now you can make paper out of any plant material. It's a show you'll grow to love. Jane Nugent's Garden Party, Thursday nights at 9 on WQEX 16. Hyacinth Bucket. No, it's not bucket, it's bouquet. <laughs> Hyacinth Bouquet is a status-conscious housewife who goes to incredible lengths in her quest for perfection. You're dropping petals on my lacquered wood block. <laughs> she only has one thing standing in her way, her family. Why would the gypsies kidnap your father, hmm? I expect for ransom. They'll be after my very expensive Royal Dalton China with the hand-painted periwinkles. <laughs> Keeping up appearances, Friday night at 8, here on WQEX. Do you remember the feeling of looking at that stately old mansion? If you've ever wondered about the people who live there, or the people who visit them, you'll feel right at home with In Country USA, Saturday at 5.30 on WQEX. Welcome back. I'm Melvin Urshano. We're talking about medical tests tonight. Uh, how about routine medical tests, doctor? Uh, what, as a mature adult, how many tests do I need each year? My routine physical exam. You're going to do the blood work, I know. I think a lot of it depends on whether you're coming in with a specific complaint or whether you're uh, coming in with no complaints. For example, okay, let's if take no complaints. No complaints. Say a person 55 years old that I've never seen before, certainly I'd like a baseline profile with sugar, cholesterol, LDL, HDL, cholesterol, mm -hmm. probably a baseline EKG. Uh, chest x-ray, if you're not a smoker, I'm not sure that's very uh, Why not? Well why, why wouldn't you just get a routine chest x-ray? Well, the odds of picking up anything are very low. Uh, it's just not cost effective to get it. The incidence of lung cancer in increasing in this country, uh, isn't that how you detect lung cancer from a chest x-ray? Sad to say that doing annual chest x-rays, there's many studies that show that annual chest x-rays, even in a smoking population, does not help diagnose lung cancer where it reduces morbidity and mortality. Okay, your analysis? Your analysis would be a very worthwhile test to get okay. and an EKG. Okay, now those home tests that you can take, it seems that you can buy a test for just about everything. What do you think about them? I think many of the home uh, tests are quite good for cholesterol and sugar. They may not give you an exact result, but they'll give you a ballpark figure whether you have a problem or not, and then certainly go see your physician. I think, I, I think I've uh, seen one advertised that uh, says that it can detect colon cancer. Well, the stool quiet cards that uh, many pharmacies will give out, as well as physician offices, can check for blood in the stool. Uh, that could be cancer, that could be polyps, that could be secondary to anti-inflammatory agents that the patient's taking for arthritis. Okay, what are some good tests that, that maybe we should do at home, especially if we're, we're trying to keep medical costs down, if we don't like to go to the doctor and, and wait for those results? What are some of the better ones? The best tests are self-examinations. For example, in women, breast examinations. Okay. Uh, looking at your skin, seeing if there's any, any abnormalities, seeing what your weight is doing, whether it's going up, going down, checking pressure, checking pulse. Some of the simple things we can do are probably more significant than the expensive tests. Okay, let's go back to the phones. Caller, line eight, you're on the air. Yes, I would like to know if there's any sure test for restless leg syndrome. I've had the nerve test, the Doppler test, and they say it's restless leg syndrome. It's hard to diagnose, and I don't know what to do about it. And one more thing. I have an elderly lady friend that got a letter from her doctor saying he no longer wants to be her doctor, a registered letter. Hmm. Is that, is that, uh, what do I want to say? I think it's cruel. But is it... Uh, okay to do that? Why would, you ever, why would you ever discharge a patient? Occasionally personality conflicts may come up between the patient and physician or the physician and the patient's family. You fire the patient because you have a personality conflict? Well, it goes a little bit uh, 
further than that. For example, suppose there were a test that you felt so strongly about that they, you needed to wake up the patient to say, hey, listen, we need to get this done because your very life hangs on this test. Okay. Uh, it's a difficult situation. It's not done often. Legally, can they do it? Yes, according to uh, the laws of Pennsylvania, they can. Okay, I think the caller wanted to know is, is it ethical? Uh, is it, uh, well, it certainly is, is probably very difficult for an elderly patient to be discharged from her physician. And don't forget the caller also asked about uh, restless leg syndrome. It, it's difficult for both the patient and the physician. It's not something I recommend. Uh, usually, uh, it, it comes after many months and years of trying to work together between a patient and physician. With respect to the restless leg syndrome, you're very right. It's very difficult to diagnose. Many people get nerve conduction studies, CAT scans, MRIs, and we still can't make a diagnosis other than clinical history. It's a very real entity, but by clinical history, yes, you probably do have it. There is some treatment out there. It's not great treatment, though. Okay, let's try to get one quick phone call in caller line seven. You're on. Yes, I had a CAT scan and then I was given an MRI. And the MRI seemed, well, it took like four hours. And I had asked the technician, why is this taking so long? And they said, well, it was a road map for surgery. Is this true? Is this a way of doing, <laughs> you know, handling it? A road map for surgery? Uh, occasionally, some of the surgeons will ask for details with the surgical area. For example, if they're looking at blood supply to a tumor. On the other hand, uh, four hours is a little bit excessive, and I'm not sure exactly what they were looking for in your case. Okay, unfortunately, we are just about out of time. Uh, we want to thank you, Dr. John Wisniewski, internist, uh, specialty gerontology at St. Margaret Memorial Hospital. And it uh, seems to be very good planning that our producer has decided that next week we should do a show on anxiety disorders, since most of us go into some kind of panic or anxiety attack when we are ordered by our physician to have a medical test. So if you're a little anxious about the medical tests that you're supposed to have, Tune in next week and we'll solve that problem for you too. Don't forget, every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, AgeWise Weekly, I'm Eleanor Shano and the good years start right here. Have a nice evening, everyone. Floral arrangement for AgeWise Weekly provided by Orr's Flower Shop of Shadyside.